we took over a Christian Scientist building, mm. and um, good for you guys. And we, yeah, and and we we over. ended up painting over the two big quotes that were on the front. There's uh, Mary Baker Eddy and this Jesus something, and you know, and but we we painted over that. But I always tell people, I'm like, especially because again, being in a Reformed church. There's no there's no artwork. I, I've just recently been commissioned to do artwork for a Lutheran church, which is a lot of fun. But there's none in my my church, and I and I always tell my the folks like on session with me, th- we are making a statement. This this big white wall, it's making a statement. Let me tell you, mm. and and if if the, if it's not, it's it could be as much a graven image as not. I mean, you think about in Washington D.C. the Vietnam. Oh yeah, yeah. It's Memorial, it's a big black yeah. wall. Very controversial. Very controversial. I, I yeah. think it's very brilliant, but it's doing the same thing. It's it is a sculpture, right? Um, and that and this is the classic line of you know you, you think you're avoiding it by not doing it, right? Actually, right. You're just doing a, a poor version. You just of yeah. it, yeah. <laughs> you uh, just circled around un, back, uninformed version of it. Yeah, you're so, flanking yourself. Um, who are you again? Who am I talking to? Uh, my name is Ned Bustard, and I'm a uh, graphic designer, book illustrator. Um, I'm the creative director for Square Halo Books, and I do other things. It's I, My daughter asked me one day, what, what do you do for a living, Dad? I'm like, I don't even know. There's a whole list. We can customize my CV to to suit and you're an artist, right? And so we're going to on a good day. Yeah, we're going to discuss some of your uh, artwork here today. You know, we're I'm, I'm going to be doing a small series here with artists and um, and the scripture. And I think the, the impulses for this is statues getting torn down. Oh yeah. Um, and a lot of my friends, uh, especially the really conservative ones, getting really upset about this. And I'm I think I sympathize with um, you know any mob ruled activity is probably you know, probably a yeah. bad idea. I mean, yeah. there's a flash in the pan, there's an impulse of the moment, but then like after that, you got to start thinking about uh, everybody making decisions about the public art uh, in some way, and not just a small group of people. Although I understand all the energy behind it, and I and I think you have to give grace in these situations. However, the question that sprung to my mind that nobody seemed to be addressing, which uh, we we're getting at a little bit there, is should Christians ever create a statue of anybody and put it up uh, in, in, a, in a way. And so I think, and again, I, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, I see impulses in scripture that make me think at the best, we should probably be very careful about what statues we put up and think about um, what we're doing, with, like the white wall, what we're doing when we put this statue up. Um, oh, yeah. Um, and thinking about various ways to engage it. And you you talked about there was a... I don't know if the solution is the right word, but there was a, a, a counter art uh, proposal for a statue of Robert E. Lee. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I just read about, I think it was this week, actually, it was in the uh, Cleveland Times, Cleveland News, something for Cleveland, Tennessee. Uh, there's a professor down there at Lee University who uh, is a member of SIVA, Christians in the Visual Arts. It's a, a group that I'm a member of, has have been for years. And uh, he posted this just in our our group chat to say, look, I'm engaging with this. And what they have is a um, normal, <laughs> normal, predictable Robert E. Lee statuary. And there's all these people who want to tear it down because that's the thing to do nowadays. And his idea was, why don't we build kind of a partial cylinder around the, the uh, statue? So you've got the statue and then the, I don't know, maybe four or five feet around it is all owned by, Daughters of the Revolution, no, what Daughters of the Confederacy, whatever they are, and uh, but the area around it's not. So his idea was build a cylinder as high as the the statue. So for some some directions, you wouldn't see the statue. So the statue's gone. Except you go around the other side of the cylinder, and there's a, a huge opening. You can see the statue unhindered. And then on the the cylinder, he proposed to have. Uh, Artwork about civil rights leaders, quotes from civil rights leaders, quotes from folks in the Confederacy. So at that point, you've got this new piece of art that is engaging with the original statue and 
creating uh, a very dynamic, um, uh, you'd say, interactive piece mm -hmm. of art where before there was just this thing that looked like it should be in a cemetery. Hmm. Yeah. And so that's, uh, it's uh, art engaging art at that point. And I, I think this is one of the things I, I actually did mostly a science degree as an undergrad. And after I finished my undergrad, I, I took a um, history of art or an art appreciation class or right. something and uh, had my doors blown open as a lot of people do. Uh, and you realize, I, I think I was the standard person. You know, I didn't like modern art, because it wasn't aesthetically, it wasn't consumeristly pleasing to me, right? And well, I, and you I, haven't, you hadn't uh, been exposed to it enough. I, I don't eat sushi, yeah. but that's the reason why I don't eat sushi yeah. is I never eat sushi. Yeah, and so that very just kind of simple engagement with does it please me visually? I'm a consumer of this art versus art that engages. And so um, we'll talk about some of your art, especially one of my favorite pieces here in a little bit, but... Um, I guess, how do you see, especially the work that I'm interested in that you've done is uh, where you take biblical narratives and you you distill them down to one frame. And, and in one way, you're translating the narrative into a visual media uh, right. or medium in this case. Um, so what's the process there by which you take a rich, complicated, ancient text and get it into one frame? I mean, in some ways, we want to say that's a bold move, right? Uh, yeah, probably uh, heretical at the end of the day. <laughs> well, and I want to get—I want to be fully fair. I was thinking about this the other day in preparation of talking to you. A sermon is doing the same thing, right? Oh yeah, and I—I—I I, I don't know if I had said this before, but I—I I think, I think that I, uh, when I come and make my work, it's very much of the same process. Hmm. Uh, one of my dear friends is is my senior pastor as well. And he and I talk, we'll talk a lot about our work over coffee. We meet weekly. And I, again and again, I'm like, you and I do the same thing. And it, it's, I, I'm always seeing parallels that are just gargantuan. Now, m my grandfather was a, a minister for 40 years. So I, I'm coming out, I'm a GPK, grand pastor's kid. Uh, so, and growing up in the church, the the communication of the gospel in clear ways that people understand is something that I was raised to value, mm -hmm. and it's very important. Um, also, and I don't know if I'm, I'm answering a question or just vamping, but as far as the distilling process, uh, my day job as a graphic designer a lot of uh, one, some of my favorite things to do is branding. And, and that is a process of distilling down a company to a mark. And I think when I'm working through, through that, it's the same process for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very much of how much can I tell you in the shortest amount of time possible? Uh, it's, it's trendy. Like I, I complain uh, when I'm talking about graphic design to people who would care, which is usually very little people. But when I'm talking about that, I'll complain about kind of the hipster logos you'll see now. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, here's uh, two forks that are crossed and it's sans serif type around it. Well, that's, I guess that's going to be a restaurant or it could be a microbrewery or it could be a cafe. They all look the same. And you look at it and you're like, well, that's slick and trendy. And it tells me nothing. Mm -hmm. And when I come to my graphic design, when I come to my art making, I want to tell you as much as possible. My book cover designs, I mean, you, that's one thing I really just drives me crazy when I see like a, a like an orange cover with black type on it. I'm like, I know nothing about this book. And note, I feel like, note to the audience that I, <laughs> I have an orange book oh, with a uh, black type on it. Oh, wow. That <laughs> but I also hate the cover. Well, there you go. Yeah. And that was unintentional. But, you know, that's just it's the Holy Spirit moving in, in the middle of a podcast. I, you know, it, for me, it's, it's, we are people who are trying to communicate, I think. Um, we have the good news and we're trying to share it. Uh, that's what we've been doing as a church for thousands of years, um, as the people of God for longer than that. Yeah. And I think the preaching, you know, I, I, I think about preaching very differently now than when I first finished seminary, but I, I, th I think I appreciate now that good preaching is evocative or as one of my pastoral theology professors said, you haven't preached the gospel unless it stings a little bit. Right. Right. And so, uh, but often what I hear people say, Oh, I like that sermon. What they meant was it was really easy as a consumer to just sit there and, 
and hear it and put it, you know, like a TED talk. Like right. The pieces it, were all lined up. Yeah. Really it had nicely. a good story. It made yeah. me laugh. Yeah. And I, I made don't me cry. Yeah. <laughs> and and it didn't, it didn't force and it didn't me. Sting. Yeah, exactly. It didn't sting. I don't think we can talk about evocative Christian art until we first address uh, why so much Christian artwork is kitschy. And I, and I, you know, I think especially of Bible sure. art, right? Um, oh, yeah. Sunday school art, I like to yeah, call it. Yeah, Sunday school art, where in some ways it's this grand irony of they're trying to represent what these scenes might have looked like. But in doing so, they often basically represent, well, let's be honest, in American culture, white people transported back in time, uh, sitting around... Uh, not really getting at what the often it's the, these pieces of art aren't getting at what the story is getting at. They're just trying to like paint the scene a little. Bit yeah, it's you. it's a diorama, and everyone's yeah, wearing yeah. their towels on their head. Exactly. Like, like. So I guess uh, what's the problem with that? And I think you could. I, I mean, I, I think of a range of biblical art from precious moments, uh, sure, which is as schlocky as it gets. To if we can throw all our Yiddish in here. Uh, <laughs> And then uh, all the way up to, you know, there's some really good Mormon artwork uh, where they actually use live actors and paint, oil painting of scenes of Jesus. Right. Um, but again, these are kind of direct representations of what they th- the scene, I guess. And I, when I look at your work, you're doing something very different than representing a scene. Right, for people. right. Uh, one of the, um, one of my favorite artists who's a, a Christian and who does, uh, I would say biblical narrative art is uh, Edward Nippers. He's a painter down in Washington, D.C. area. And he likes to say that he does uh, poetic interpretations of of the of the scenes. And I think that that's where um, uh, I, I'm going to probably a little bit more literal than he does. Like he 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 does brings in cubist elements and and really uh, kind of vamps on different ideas in his work. I'm trying to show you the work, but then a lot of my work has a lot of symbolism in it. So you, you, uh, there's a decoding uh, factor. I think you're talking about kind of the range of biblical art. You do have the precious moments. Uh, you have the Sunday school art that we were raised on. I always tell people, I know, you know who Jesus is because he's the guy with the red sash. Right. And, um, and I've used that to my advantage in some of my work. In, in European painting, there is, there is a history to which color goes with which. Disciple. Oh, absolutely, and, and and Mary always wears blue. blue yeah. You know, there, there's there's these these uh, uh, yeah shorthand, and, and you know, almost it is, is almost branding at mm-hmm. that point. Um, but and then you have the the kind of photorealistic, almost uh, one of the uh, great paintings in the Philadelphia Art Museum is uh, Henry Tanner's uh, Annunciation, and that's where Mary's receiving the news. That her life is going to basically be horrible, and uh, and it, and sh- everything's. Uh, Henry Tanner was very interested in giving you exactly what um, the Middle East looked like at that time. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's it's his attempt to be photorealistic. Now his angel is this like shimmering shaft of light, and it's funky cool. But that that's his. But he's trying to do that. Then you've got. Um, you know, in the middle of the, the road, we've got uh, Kincaid, bless his heart. He, you know, he he's just trying to make something yeah, saccharine and, and is, sweet. Uh, uh, what's his first name? Thomas Kincaid. Thomas Kincaid, yeah, painter yeah. of light, L I T. Who's who's passed away, right? Oh yeah, he died. Yeah, uh, but he, his stuff is very. I, in in my book, it was good making art to the glory of God. I talk about his work because it is so heretical. Right. Uh, it looks nice, but it's it, it. He he said, uh, I think it was in Christianity Today that he wants to paint the world as if sin never happened. Well, okay, then we have to throw out the whole Bible, and basically, you're off the reservation, buddy. Right. Uh, so you've got that, and then you've got uh, you know the Sunday school art where they're just trying to get the the, I guess the context a little bit, mm-hmm. but not really uh, the context versus the story, I guess. And then you do have the precious moments, which is taking. Um, a bloody, violent, uh, disturbing faith that we subscribe to and making it uh, with big balloon head kids. So, uh, okay, well, that m- it might look nice on the hutch, but it's not Christianity any- anymore. And that, for me, uh, uh, my daughter goes to uh, the King's College and her her house 
Uh, their motto is grace and truth. And for me, that's what it comes down to. It's, I, my, I want my work to point at both of those things. Yeah, and I think uh, actually I I knew about you before I met you from your daughter because she was in my uh, introduction to Hebrew scripture class, and she loved it. And uh, she, uh, I just remember a few weeks in, she goes, "I think you would get along really well with my dad," <laughs> <laughs> which is both a compliment and a backhanded. Yeah. <laughs> and then she described to me this book uh, revealed that she said, "Oh, well, he's working on this book that's like all the horrible stories in the Bible, <laughs> but like a children's Bible." Uh, with art in it of all the horrible stories. And so um, let's talk about some of your art and we'll post pictures of this, uh, of this art online. Some of Ned's work uh, here, you do a lot of um, what's the name of this. I, I want to say block cut, but it's- yeah, uh, there's, it's a, uh, you could say block cut. You could say uh, relief print. It's printmaking. Uh, the medium, uh, a lot of times we'll call it lino cuts because I'm using linoleum. Oh, yeah. Uh, but people will often say, oh, I like your wood cuts. It's the same thing. It's right. just I'm using it's linoleum medium, versus yeah. wood because wood's just harder to cut. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's, it's a, and also people will look at my stuff and, and figure out what I've done. They're like, oh, I did that in seventh grade. I'm like, yes, yeah. you did. This is, it's a very <laughs> easy technique to learn easy to to teach and it's just very simple and um and that's one of the reasons i i was drawn to it is my day job is graphic design so i'm copy paste copy paste mm. save as and this is the exact opposite mm. of it and i i like the tactileness of it i like the fact that i can screw it up and uh you know obviously i don't like screwing it up but i that that thing that i might fall off of the wire and die right at any moment you know it's just is kind of exciting with right the, the medium and so I, i'm we're looking at this one that's titled and i love it too because you know if you think about easy to consume art uh this is this is visually i, I mean I, I like your style i like I, I it's just aesthetically it appeals to me but also as soon as you look at it and you say well now what is this and then um and then you read the title uh this this print in front of me it has Two looks like to me Egyptian gentlemen, a lightning bolt, a hand coming through uh, a circle with the triangle in it, uh, an oxen that looks like Yah, um, the, the the Egyptian god. Um, Good old Yah. I'm not sure what this is. At That's the a uh, um, with the Sherlock Holmes. He carries a. Uh, um, sorry. Oh, it's a, this is a magnifying glass. Sorry, magnifying glass. Yeah, got yes. it with the with the with the, the triquetra. In yeah, the, middle the, the, the traditional which is a tri- triangular yeah. thing that's knotted for those yeah, the, who aren't sitting in the room with it's us. It's often used for Trinity. Uh, yes, uh, and then the title is Romans one eighteen through thirty two. Right, exactly. <laughs> so that's immediately evocative because the guys, the two gentlemen, have this kind of direct gaze towards each other. Um, they're, they're holding the, each other. They're holding each other. Yeah, yeah. So I guess what. Romans, and I'll, I'll leave it to the the audience to go back and refresh their memory with Romans one eighteen through thirty two. But uh, this is a, as evocative as as it comes. How do you choose what goes into this frame? Though? Well, this piece, uh, yeah. Again, if you read Romans, you'll figure out what what where I'm going with this. But the uh, what for me, one of the things that was interesting the the two men in the picture, I based on uh, actual. Um, Egyptian art. These are the, as far as art historians will say, these are the first, this is the first depiction of a homosexual couple in art history. So this is the, the, uh, it was the, what is it? The cosmetic, cosmetician, what, 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 the person who does the, the, right. the beautician right. to the Pharaoh right. is it's him and his, his husband or lover or whatever. Okay. So I found that and I was like, wow, this is amazing that this, this exists. And that passage is dealing with idolatry. And so, um, the idea of the golden calf really appealed to me. So I, I wanted to kind of bring those together. Uh, and if you look at the, the piece it goes through the verse, and I, I have all the elements of the verse in there. Uh, you've got the hand of God um, at the top coming out of the triangle. That, that's a traditional symbol for uh, 
for God the Father. And that's a something in my artwork you'll see a lot. I, I often will mine traditional Christian art for for things. Now, what's different about this, and a lot of times it's what is different about this is what mm-hmm. I really want you to see. Normally, the hand of God coming out of the triangle, the the triangle's not inverted, and here it's inverted. So this is uh, a... Instead of God the Father and His hand coming down, giving up to us, this is this is judgment. The lightning bolt is coming out of there. Uh, so this is God's God's uh, God the Father, uh, yeah, in in um, justice or um, cur- you know the passage says that he's he's not happy, yeah. and um, but then it also says that uh, in 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 Romans one that. The invisible attributes of God are clearly seen. Now, I put the triquetra as a symbol for the Trinity in the 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 what do we call that again? Magnifying glass. Magnifying glass. Yeah. And because I thought a lot of times we we say that verse, but you have to be looking. And most of the times we don't we don't look. We don't see those uh, God's invisible attributes that you really have to look. And so that's, that's where that piece is in there. Um, according to the, the verse, the verse uh, or the, the artwork reads uh, left to right, top to bottom, inverted from the way the Bible verse reads. So you right. have to read it backwards. Right. Uh, but again, I, found, I started with that image of those two men and that informed the whole piece. Normally my work, is very uh I, I say faux gothic or, or mock medieval. This is me trying to intentionally look Egyptian because I want to tie into all those ideas uh with with um what you know what what does when I think of a, a an idol, of course I think of Egyptian idols and and the golden calf and this is playing around with all of those wow. ideas. And well and I think um I thought this one was particularly interesting because when I'm when I'm reading Roman, Romans, I'm never thinking in my mind of Egypt until I see this. Right, right. And I think, okay, why Egypt? Why? Well, okay, well, Paul is a Jew who is steeped in the Torah. The Torah is referring, like, so it, I, you know, all of a sudden I'm drawn into Paul's mind, like, oh, when he's thinking of idolatry, he's looking at the temple to Artemis, uh, he's looking at the temples that surround him in every city he's going to. But he also has this imagination uh, that draws this this Torah imagination. Well, cultural that, imagination. Yeah, he, cultural, yeah, he remembers back to Egypt. Yes, he his remembers people. through uh, through the Torah back to Egypt, and so yeah, it's it kind of challenges my assumption that it was just Roman uh, Roman idolatry that he's attacking here, but he's actually and there's there's a PhD dissertation on this as well. <laughs> it says no, actually, you can read Romans one as only to Jews. Like everything that's described in Romans one is is something the Hebrews did in the Torah. Well, and for me too, being culturally Western, I'm very comfortable with Greek and Roman idols mm-hmm. because they're they're culturally held up to me as a good, and I recognize them a, as. Um, idealized humans, and because of the Renaissance, I, I like them. They're comfortable, and because of movies, uh, exactly. Also, yeah, entire universes that are exactly. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, you know, I've got uh, Percy and the whatever and all that. I'm very happy. I don't see them as threatening to me. Uh, I don't see them even as idolatry often. But Egyptians, oh yeah, those right. guys are all about the idols. It, you know, it, culturally in my mind, right? So, and I really want you to see. That all of this is idolatry. Yeah. So it's it's a very uh, again, and, and th- I'm glad that you like that. Most people don't like that print, and I've shown that very very little uh, because it is so controversial. Well, your your daughter was right that she 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 said <laughs> yeah, that you and I would yeah. get along on this front. Well, and I think uh, you know everything you said there just tells me uh, you're pushing my own interpretation of the world, my interpretation of art, my interpretation of Paul, my interpretation of the the Torah. It all meets in this collection. Uh, which I think is what the the, the power of good art uh, does is it draws upon what you know and what you think you know and challenges that. Uh, well, and, and as far this as is pushing, in one frame, I'm trying to push you also, uh, which would be distinctive about my work, not universally, but generally that I want to push you towards scripture too. Right. Like I'm not trying to push you away from scripture. I'm pushing you deeper into scripture. At least that's my intent. Yeah, and I think also in, in general. 
uh, I mean, this is a question of mine is, do you feel like when you work through this process, even creating like this one, this one block cut frame, do you feel like you've come to understand scripture better through that process? Oh, absolutely. Most of the time when I'm working on these, uh, pieces, uh, in a sidebar, one artist friend of mine is like, can't you do work that's not biblical? And I'm like, well, yeah, I guess, except this is just what comes out of me. You know, like I said, uh, my grandfather's a, a preacher. I'm an elder in my church. Uh, the f- integrating my faith and uh, art has been my uh, passion for my whole adult life. Um, and that was a sidebar getting off of what you just said, which was, oh, does it push me deeper into it? Yeah. So when I'm working on these pieces, I will go back to scripture because I want to make sure I get it right. And I also want to make sure that I haven't missed something. Uh, and that I am pulling out things that are, are under the surface, that are the deeper, what's the deeper meaning? Mm. Um, what, you know, how can I connect you from this piece to Genesis? Or how can I connect you from this piece to Revelation? Because, you know, the whole scripture being one great story, I want to I wanna make those connections for you mm-hmm. or encourage you towards them. Well, I think it definitely encourages, and it's uh, it's what I love about it. Well, encourages or discourages, depending yeah. on Yeah, some of, of my art's not happy. Yeah, I want to talk about one other piece here um, that is my favorite piece, and it's actually much simpler than the last piece. Uh, and again, one of the pieces that most people hate. Yes. And my wife said, <laughs> why are you doing that? So unlike a, a portion of Paul's teaching, this collects together an entire story, um, which is also a story that is riffing off of another story. So this is Judges 19 uh, of the town of Gibeah, which is a retelling of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. But this time it's Israelites who are doing this. Right. Um, and in, in some places in the Hebrew, it's almost word for word, just cut and paste over from the Sodom and Gomorrah well, story. it's easier that way. Yeah, it's simpler. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what I have in front of me, uh, and again, we'll put the, these images on the website in the show notes, is uh, is it's 12 pieces of a woman's body. And so you have her head, you have two legs, but only one arm, her torso, her hips cut into pieces and displayed. Um, I don't know, how would, you, how would you call this? Quasi-symmetrically in a, in a rectangle. Um, and of course, if you don't know the story, I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm going to be the one breaking this to you. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the Levite's concubine um, who is cut up into pieces. It's a horrible story. The Levite is a, seems to be a horrible person. The town seems to be full of horrible people. The town from which Saul, the first Messianic king of Israel, from which he comes, um, creates a, a, a civil war where they almost kill off the entire tribe of the Benjaminites, which ends up in the abductive uh, sexual abuse of women from across. It's it's just. Let's say it's not prescriptive. Yes, it's bad. <laughs> Don't bad, do anything bad. that's in this passage. Like the further you read, the worse it gets. And uh, so, I guess the question is: of all of the, I mean, there are so many things going on in that story. Um, why did you choose that element? You know, in what way did you think that twelve pieces of a woman's body cut up uh, and displayed? Um, and mostly, it's just. It's it's black and white. There are no shades of gray here, right? This is very stark. This is very yeah. It's very very. It's and if uh, if you're familiar with um, the movie poster Anatomy of a Murder, uh, that was designed by a man named Saul Bass, and I was inspired by that piece. In that in that uh, poster, uh, the main element is this kind of bold black hand that's reaching down from the top of the page and mm. the the hand that's in the middle of this piece is is a, somewhat like that but it was that the 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 just the 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 violently um violently bold almost like a knife cut illustration that that attracted me to to his work and then I was like oh a lot of times I'm trying to steal what other people have done they've just figured out i'm just going to try and do my own riff every book i've ever written yeah i mean if you look through even revealed uh, a lot of the pieces you'll see that i've done it'll say like after van gogh or after you know mm. fill in the blank so this is this is my uh 
tip of the hat to Saul Bass. But uh, the reason it, 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 it attracted me was um, because, number one, it is so disturbing and violent that, I, that it, it's shocking. And I think that so often we're not shocked or surprised by Scripture. Again, either you're reading it wrong or you're reading with presuppositions mm-hmm. uh, that that make it so that you don't see this. The man cuts up his what, living wife, right. you know, kind of thing, the concubine. And so it's a horribly violent story that we just read over. And I uh, with uh, certainly with revealed, but a lot of my work, I, I want you to I want you to see and you are you know, we're so desensitized that we don't see often. With this piece, uh, again, uh, I I love beauty. I also love the feminine form. It, it's a I I think women are gorgeous. I love my wife; she's beautiful. I also know that pornography is a horrible thing throughout time, but certainly nowadays, I, I, I often bemoan, I say, you know, if when I was a kid, you had to, it was at 7-Eleven, but it was right. behind the-, the you to go find it, it Yeah, I mean, left it somewhere. you had to yeah. really work and be yeah. cre- clever and, and have an uncle who subscribed right. to Playboy or something. I just couldn't get to pornography. Right. Thank God. Thank God, yeah. yeah. Now we've destroyed an entire generation because we've given it to them on their phones. So for me, this piece is- uh, as much about that as it is about um, the the scripture passage. Now, don't misread me. I'm not saying that this is not about the scripture passage. It is illustrating that. But what I wanted you to see was the horrible way that this man um, treated his this woman, his wife. How anti biblical from a marriage standpoint this right. is, and then that he cut her up in pieces. And mailed it around. It just made me think of pornography, mm. where we're cutting up women and mailing mm. them around. Uh, now we do it electronically, and it's much more efficient. There's no blood, um, but it's it's that it's that violence against women that I find so, well violence of women and violence against a biblical view of sexuality and and the marriage bed. And I, you know, Paul says, let's keep the marriage bed pure. And this is the exact opposite of that. And so it's, I find it offensive um, because I like sex. I like, right. I, I love the human way that that brings people together. I love what it shows us about Christ and the church. And then I see what pornography is doing to that. And, you know, again, doing to a whole generation, you know, I've, I have daughters who are teenagers and I'm like, I don't know if you're going to be able to find anyone who's, who's not damaged by pornography. Right. Um, now we were supposed to be talking about art in the Bible. I don't mean to go off, but that, that's where this, this piece is coming from and going. Um, like I said, you're, you're one of two or three people who like this piece, uh, be, just because it's so disturbing. Well, and it, 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 it doesn't let you turn your head. You have to ask this question: How did you get a woman into in twelve pieces into, being yeah. mailed mailed out to the tribes? And you, in, in many ways, it's this this piece is almost like a movie that opens with some real bizarre scene. I couldn't think of any off the top of my head. No, no then, yeah. Imagine then, if this was a movie; it would yeah. be a great way to start the right. Start the is film. You start with him cutting this woman into twelve, yeah. and then and then yeah. what do you do? And and also, I you know, very bizarre with my students, I always like to get them to think about the material world, what it was like on the ground and think like, Oh, which parts did he cut and how did he cut and how hard was it? And and how do you ship that? Yeah. Was you without wrap FedEx? It in something? Yeah. Did it, you put it in a basket and was there a note or was it just left, you know, with, uh, with the messenger and the logistics of the whole thing um, is daunting. It is daunting. And so this kind of just forces, you know, whatever you want to say about what's going on in Judges, there is a woman and 12 pieces being sent out to the tribe. Yeah, deal like, with that. Yeah, that's, you have to deal with that. Um, I wonder, um, what do you think is encouraging about Christian art? Or what, what you know, you're you're uh, somebody who's influential in the sphere. You work with artists. Uh, I do. I have an art gallery. I show artists. Yeah, in Lancaster, Lancaster, mm-hmm. Lancaster, Lancaster. And uh, I was I couldn't remember how it was pronounced. Um, what What do you think is exciting in in Christian art? Uh, and I'm and by Christian art, I don't 
mean Christians doing art. I mean uh, people who are actually trying to work with scripture. And I, and if I can give you a comparison, in film, I have typically not found that Christians who make Bible films or te- television shows, I don't find those to be very good or accurate to the text. Um, right. I have found something like um, – uh, is it Arnofsky's Noah actually picks up lots of things that are going on in the biblical text better than any other Noah account I've seen or read. Um, I felt like tree of life by Terrence Malick probably understood biblical poetry uh, right. visually That's a great better film. than, better than any other film. Um, so these aren't people who are Christians trying to make Christian stuff for Christian people to consume. So I wonder if there's something parallel in the art world. Well, I, I think Malick's uh, tree of life, I think is a great example of what, uh, is good because it, he uh, he's coming at it. Uh, my f- friend Greg Wolf would say coming at it slant, and, um, which he got from another writer. Uh, and doesn't he edit a, uh, a book series called Slant? Yeah, and that's where he got the <laughs> oh, okay. that's where he got the name for that. And just and I think you know the Malik's coming at it. He's not coming at it straight on. And I think that that's um, setting aside the question of what's going well right now. When you see, going back to what what's um, lame art from a Christian perspective, it's usually not coming at it slant. It's usually coming at it straight on and trying to, uh, well, it's trying to proselytize you. Right. And that makes for bad art. And you see that, um, you know, all, I mean, it doesn't have to be Christian to be bad that way. Like there's, uh, I, I'm a big Doctor Who fan and I've... Um, enjoyed that over the years a sci-fi thing with sci-fi and especially the the, the couple recent seasons of of doctor who it's it's trying to proselytize you it's it's it has these ideas that it wants to cram down your throat mm. and i'm like you know by the way i'm going to i'm going to accept your uh the the poison of your ideas if you wrap it in something sweeter hmm. than this than this like a uh, sledgehammer that you're trying to do right. that's how art works it comes at you from an angle hmm. it's what you see out of the corner of your eye that doesn't quite register but gets into works into your system and i think that when you see good artwork that's what it's doing it's not coming at you straight it's coming at you from an angle and it's it's i always say this it's making you stop it's making you look it's making you see. And um, uh, Kincaid didn't make you see. Uh, Sunday school art, again, it's just trying to tell you something. It's not trying to invite you in. Uh, and un- understandably so. I mean, they're trying to get from point A to point B as fast as they can. Uh, and good art doesn't never takes a direct route you know it's just it's just a drive through the countryside that eventually you 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 figure out where you are and where you were and um and you understand things deeper and feel things deeper uh going back to to good things i see in art um i I mentioned siva earlier Uh, i've been a member of siva for 20 years and for me that's Christian and Christians visual in the arts. visual arts. Yeah. yeah, they it's a, a large organization has members around the world, mostly North America, but um, yeah, all over. And um, I've really uh, that's that's been a lifesaver for me, just as as a visual artist myself, growing up in the church, knowing that if I was a good Christian, I'd be a minister or a missionary, mm-hmm. but certainly not an uh, artist. Uh, here, I found a, a group of people who hold to scripture, uh, hold to the Orthodox faith, and are making artwork that is gallery, you know, world-class art. Uh, That's what really I find encouraging. It's encouraging to see uh, Christians making art that is top-notch. Also, Christians making art that is across the genres. There, you, you can't say, uh, in in our day, this is Christian art, mm. and point to a particular piece and say uh, like like uh, impressionism. Well, right. you know, if I because if I'm sure if our brothers and sisters in, in the in the mainstream church would say let's make a a Christian art form, it would be impressionism with right. with uh, Jesus, um, and a fish. You know that 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 would be that would be what Christian art would be. And what I like is like I said, certainly through Siva. I've seen there's artists out there who are making art to the glory of God and 
very thoughtful and very contemporary. Uh, they are they're speaking the language of of their of their um, generation, but coming uh, but what they're saying is is gospel truth. One last question. Um, um, only one. Yeah. I, I want to talk we, we can all go on afternoon. On um, how do you uh, how do you see art? And, and I see this in the literature of scripture. You know, poetry. We we actually just posted an article by Michelle Knight and um, Malcolm Geit. Um, oh, I love Malcolm. Yeah, I didn't realize they rhymed until now. Um, but uh, on poetry, but I bet a, she doesn't have a, a pipe and, and drive <laughs> and a drive a, a motorcycle and you know look like yeah, a dwarf. I'll tell Michelle to start working on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it'll help. The uh, but this poetry is a form of argument, right? That it's not just right. we think of poetry as internal expression, as the inside coming out to some kind of a form, and you know, vomit. There's a, almost a vomit metaphor going on here. And it's like no, no, this is actually engaging you directly and. How do you see, you know, if you think about just visual arts, the plastic arts uh, specifically, how do you see them as forms of argument? I would say when they are forms of argument, that's when they're they're doing a good job. Uh, culturally, we do have this idea that I um, emotionally vomit on the canvas and that's art. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's um, an unfortunate... Uh, gift from the generation before us culturally um i people ask me about raising kids you know how how do i teach kids to do art how how can they express themselves i'm like i don't want them expressing themselves you know when we don't Amen. uh we don't give a child a book and say now just get whatever you want from this we teach them phonics we mm. teach them to read this is an A, this is a B, this is a C. Mm. You can't make up what you feel about that. And um, But when it comes to the visual arts, we say, express yourself, which is the worst thing because you're, you're never going to be able to make good art right. if, you're, if you start there. Um, if, you, if you give your child a piano and say, just express yourself, that child is never going to be in Carnegie Hall. It's just never going to happen because to really – to really make good art is requires discipline and it's a, uh, it, it's propositional. Like you are working towards something. I think that what uh, people may not pick up on, on the, uh, you were asking if art is uh, an argument, an or, argument. I or, don't think reasoning. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't think people pick up on the argument and the reasoning of art most of the time because uh, they don't understand the language. Uh, a friend of mine named James Romain, he's an art historian. He's done several books for Square Halo. He, he'll, uh, I steal this one idea from him about uh, people having a Dick and Jane level visual literacy. That if you, if, you know, if you, if you have a Dick and Jane level literacy, you can't read Moby Dick. So for our younger listeners, these oh, are the books right. that we all learn in the first grade. Or yeah, I think all of us in the yeah, first yeah. grade, we learned to read by C. C. Dick Run, C. Jane Run. Yeah, and they had a dog, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. Yes, so, yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry to primal English. I'm sorry to be yeah. one of these old people who just, can't just speak to, make to sure. his, his, his uh, generation. Uh, but we so, have a we have a pediatric uh, visual language and literacy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, I, so yeah. So you see that because I think if you if you get into the conversation. Of, of of the art world. And if you go to a gallery, you learn that people are making um, arguments. They are making uh, strong cases for things. And I would say, submit a, a lot of the crap that you'll see is when people confuse um, making an argument with making art. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is where it gets um, interesting. Uh, I think you could let's say a parallel between uh, cooking, like you might want to make me a vegan and you could push that as hard as you want. The best way to do it is make me some really good food mm -hmm. and then say, oh, by the way, this is vegan. And then the next day, oh yeah, that was vegan too. Mm. And that chocolate cake you just ate, vegan. All right, I'm 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 on board now. Now, if you start every meal and say, okay, here's, this is vegan and I think you should only eat vegan and I'm not going to let you eat this, this, and this because that's not vegan. Well, you're, you're, you're a preacher now in the worst possible sense. 
And, uh, and the same thing happens in the arts mm -hmm. that you have people who are preaching and, uh, and not making good art. And I think that it denies some of our humanity and, uh, it reduces us not in a nice reduction way that you'd you know, pour over meat, but yeah. in a bad way. Yeah. Not, not making good art in that sense equates to, uh, not reasoning with us, uh, Right. Really well, push, pushing and, rather and than ignoring, reasoning. ignoring what about art really we like, we like, it's a visual medium mm -hmm. and it's, it's beauty. Uh, you know, again, uh, culturally we've, we, many people have just shifted beauty you know, or ditched beauty and they've ditched, uh, goodness and truth and all these things. And what you find is the, 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 the good stuff is when you say, oh, that is beautiful. Or there, there is, there's a transcendent element to that. And if you are trying to just build an argument uh, alone, it's going to be bad art. Right. But the best art has very strong propositional elements to it. Hmm. You may not understand that because you have a, a low vi visual literacy, but, but that's what's happening. There are, there are, there are ideas that are coming across and trying to be communicated. And uh, you know, they talk about, uh, talking about Malcolm, uh, he and I have been talking about the idea of poetic knowledge, that there, there's, there's a poetry involved here that gets to truth that you can't get to by just yeah. propositional truth, propositional yeah. statements. Right. Metaphors don't reduce, uh, visual metaphors don't reduce. Exactly. Yeah, they actually exactly. get more than they can be reduced to. Yeah, th th there are yeah. things that you know that you don't know that you can't even tell me that you know yeah. because it's something that you know that's not um that it that is metaphor that is yeah. uh that you something you access through through beauty through touch yeah owen barfield is particularly mm -hmm. good on on this topic um yeah and i think most people don't think of art as argument until it's hyper offensive so you know that you say well art's not really an, it's not right. reasoning with people and then you say piss christ and they're right, like right. oh yeah that's an argument right well, and, and or, I or think, the blank walls at your Protestant church. Exactly. Right. I think that, but that I think again is where they're, they're missing it. Cause a lot of times if they, they, they don't realize that or it, that's, it's working on them very well and they haven't realized that they've, right. they've, they've, they've adopted all. I mean, that's what I always say, you know, when I'm talking to my kids about the music they're listening to, the, the movies they're watching, I'm like, this is, this is getting, ideas into your head mm -hmm. you're accepting them because you like the art form mm. but you need to be, you need to be aware of what you're what you're consuming what you're engaging with because yeah. art is not neutral it's going to do something it's going to say something you are going to either have to agree with it or disagree with it and um if you can't figure out what that is and hold it up to scripture you're lost thank you ned Thank you, Drew. Be sure to subscribe, rate, or leave us a review wherever you found us. Want to learn more about Hebraic Thought? Visit our website at hebraicthought.org.